and certainly they must play. When I was in graduate school, there was actually a course in 17th century lit that I took, a lot of people are drunk, you can see, called In the English Bible, and it was a course in not the religious aspects of the uh, King James Version, but the, the literary aspects, but it is an astounding work of 17th century literature. Coverdale's problem was, and this is a difficulty for a translator of the Bible, he had no Greek, no Hebrew, and no Latin. So this made translation a little hard. Uh, so he worked from German and French text and played around with them and where they intermingled and stuff like that. It's sort of like uh, if you've ever played with a Google Translator, <laughs> you can get some odd things. For example, if you type in on Google Translator, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood and ask it to translate it into Japanese? Mm -hmm. And then you take the Japanese and you ask it to translate it back into English, here's what you get. <laughs> How much would chuck could chuck cook hack a two cooker if you can throw a tree? <laughs> well, that's sort of what happens with Coverdale sometimes. But it's so beautiful because Coverdale was an astounding writer. I mean, he, he made beautiful things. And this is entitled, Point Inspired by Mistranslation by Coverdale. And what he wrote, what he was trying to say, what it literally says, is foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. But what he wrote is much, much better. But it's just, doesn't exactly, you don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> he wrote, this is in Psalm 18, the 45th line of the psalm. The strange children shall fail and be afraid out of their prisons. Well, I just love that. I don't know what it means, but it's just it's kind of magical. So it inspired a poem. Now, don't ask me. I mean, a lot of poets write poems that they don't mean anything, and that's because they're really not very good poets. In 50 years, I've written two poems that really don't exactly mean. This is one of them. But it means as much as Coverdale's line, mm -hmm. which I would have been happy to have written. <laughs> poem inspired by mistranslation by Coverdale. The strange children shall fail and be afraid out of their prisons. And no doubt they shall both fail and fear, for their strangeness is upon them, marks them, sets them apart, marks them with oddness, strangeness, and the elliptical measures of their dissembling calculations. And they will be unable to whip their coats round them and hide themselves in the flurry of their cloth. And it will be as if they were naked, and they shall be seen in their nakedness, male and female alike, seen alike in the strangeness of their being, being neither one nor the other, but strange. So they will be naked, bound in irons, awayed and imprisoned, rebuked and removed, and their teeth will chatter and fail like game counters cut from tusk. And though their cells will whirl and rattle in the storm of their dissembling calculi, their fears will not be slack, and all their stones will roll between their bars, roll from their cells and not return, and their strange counting will cease. <laughs> and there's a very famous one of two little children, two twins that died. And, uh, they have, if you know, if you remember it, they have heads and sometimes little wings come out of their heads or wings come out of their shoulders. There are all these little angels there. And that, that meeting house is so austere. It, it's terrifying. It's terrifying like that old faith. Big wind at Rockingham. <coughs> On this hillside, forgotten Puritans merge with the earth beneath their splitting slate. Time-fractured markers cut with wigged faces bearing wings are children caught in alien sleep. Their young mothers remembered in a flourish of lamentation, childbirth, and blood, all metered and rhymed in 18th century grief. The big wind rises and loose snow lifts and whirls around their stones, crumbling now in the passage of centuries of changeless sorrow. What hard wind slipped and hung round them in the gallows of their cold thought? This high lean church, as unadorned as their certain pride, shatters down on them in all the cold verses of their faith. 
The great waving bushes of the yard shake, blossomless now, glittering in ice, crackling in the wooing wind, whose drones weave round the stalks like dreams of wisping women gowned in malign. Or so these dead might have thought had they stood among their stones in this big wind over Rockingham, where I stand among them looking out at sweeping acres all snowed down in the high cried winds that seem a part of them, of their hard time, and of a set and shouldered faith. And I think on their sculptor's dreams of all that winging of slate, mere heads or heads and shoulders or whole bodies angeling away toward what austerity had promised, a heaven like this cold-blown hill in Rockingham, little better for a reward's sake, for a blessing, than their final compass with compass compact with the soil. In this big wind over Rockingham, I move to the margins of their yard and stand looking out at those sweeping acres, all snowed down, immaculate in the consolation of winter, watching light fall warm on white hills, <coughs> fall brighter than the angelic prayers, the slate-cut hopes of sculptors, of elders, and of their fragile, frightened children. Now for something more pleasant. <laughs> so this is a, a poem by another Victorian poet, Matthew Arnold, uh, a narrative poem called The Forsaken Merman.
Yeah. 